Well, uh, for those of you um, who don't know me, my name is Mishi Chaudhary. I am the legal director, and there is um, Jim. Are you Jim Wright or Oracle? Take your pick, and please join us here. Um, I am the legal director at the Software Freedom Law Center. Unlike Richard Fontana, I needed too much training, so I'm still here. <clears throat> This panel is called Why Copyright is Not the Answer to Everything, or different versions of our agenda as it has seen. Maybe copyright is the answer to everything. Um, uh, additional restrictions in um, open source licenses, uh, we've seen to address labor rights, human rights, business model protections. They're all driving this new proliferation boomlet. There is the anti-996 license that requires compliance with all applicable laws, regulations, rules, standards relating to labor and employment law. Last year, we had another panel discussion where we had discussed some bits of it, um, common clause by Redis Labs. Uh, we had discussed about SSPL from MongoDB. Um, but a lot of experts, such as yourselves, uh, in this room and elsewhere, are almost universally skeptical. This is a panel where we are going to discuss and uh, ask these very smart people about what do they think. Uh, joining me here from my left is Jim Wright. As I said, he will uh, perhaps uh, introduce himself uh, because I'm not sure what affiliations he is representing, but this bio says he's Oracle's chief architect for open source policy, <laughs> strategy, compliance, and alliances. Um, he is admitted to practice in the state of California. Rest of it, I will urge you, these big books, if you are not planning to use them as door stoppers or throw them, they actually do have some very interesting materials organized by the panels. So uh, you may want to read them, and uh, there is perhaps a link also available in case uh, there's no space in your luggage. Uh, then you can access them online. Um, then to my left as, uh, is Richard Fontana, who you heard in the earlier panel. And um, everybody knows how great he is. So I am not going to say anything further about him and uh, move on to even more interesting and fascinatingly achieve, uh, achievers. To my right is Jelaine Lovejoy. Uh, she's a lawyer and community leader uh, and leads co-leads the software package data exchange legal team. Jelaine is now legal counsel at Canonical, the company behind Ubuntu, where she focuses on commercial drafting and negotiating open source software and trademarks. Uh, previously, she was principal open source counsel at ARM, and like everybody, this profile is too big, too many achievements. Again, they will prove when they open their mouths to talk about this topic, how great they are. And Karen Copenhaver. Karen Copenhaver, um, is uh, um, a mentor, a guide to several of us here, and now serves as outside counsel to the Linux Foundation. And I don't know how many years she's been named the lawyer of the year. So the lawyer of the decade or the millennia. Um, so uh, again, please read these bios. Um, then is Professor Eben Moglen. Um, I, I've had the chance to introduce Eben many a times, but uh, to me, he will always be the person who's teaching us all how to use words to make justice in the world and society. And um, that's what I'm going to say about him. <laughs> and move on to this uh, fascinating panel here. Uh, as I said, last year we had this discussion about these licenses. We've also seen a lot of activism coming from the VC world uh, to tell how um, the entire uh, the community here, whether it is OSI or Free Software Foundation, what is right, what is wrong. We've seen a proliferation of uh, using the licenses to address issues, which are actual issues, human rights issues, labor rights issues, new business models emerging. And uh, every time, copyright seems to be the panacea. It will solve everything. Um, I am not that smart, so I don't think it will solve everything, but I would like to know how it can or it cannot, and why is it the answer to certain things, and uh, ask this panel what their view about false licensing is, and whether um, 
copyright can address the issues which we are looking at right now. And I'm gonna let each one of them have uh, an opening statement uh, to set the tone about what they think about the topic in general. And thereafter, I will start posing some questions to them and uh, let them answer um, as they see fit. I'm going to um, start with Jim Wright. I'll keep it short. Um, all the people who know me know that's basically never true. Um, uh, but I, I think the, sh the short answer is uh, why it's not. I, I don't want to pre-conclude things like enforceability, like wh whether, it, whether it will actually work if we tried it. Rather, I, I think I would focus more on pragmatism. Is it practical to attempt to use licenses and copyright constraints to control for any of a wide variety of behaviors other than those which are most directly connected to the enumerated copyright rights? Um, it, it is my uneducated take that the complexity of ex already extant software systems is sufficiently high, even in the absence of ethical constraints in the licenses, that I have difficulty imagining, for example, trying to assemble a Linux distribution, which has licenses constraining labor behaviors or surveillance behaviors. Actually, humorously, this being on this panel, Evan, I don't know if you remember, um, I have a, a, a funny recollection of being in San Francisco, also with you, Karen, um, around 2010-ish, there was a Linux Foundation Council meeting in San Francisco, and it was, uh, relatively, you know, a couple years after after V3. And I remember saying to Eben, oh, well, you know, we should make GPL V4 about targeting surveillance. <laughs> and the fact that this was brought up now again, you know, 10 years later, uh, gave, gave me a little chuckle. But the, in my mind, the idea of First of all, for distributors of software attempting to manage conflicting ethical obligations, but but beyond that, you know, do we think that we want judges deciding on just let's let's consider the JSON license, right? Do we want a judge deciding whether a use of software is good or evil, right? What about indirect infringement? If I give that software to somebody who I should have reason to know is doing evil, the, the, uh, the, the complexity of managing these kinds of obligations uh, seems, seems difficult at best to me. And then place that in the context that you know, Professor Carroll was talking about of disappearing businesses and let alone state actors you know, <laughs> try, trying to use copyright licenses to, or copyright, in, I shouldn't say copyright licenses because we can put whatever we want in a license, but trying to use copyright infringement as a vehicle for those controls strikes me as less viable than other quanta of control. Um, I think, you know, honestly, if it, to be to be blunt, I feel like there's a whole lot of sound and fury um, <laughs> signifying self-indulgent moaning. Um, I, <laughs> I I feel like 
if, if we're all complaining about Facebook, why the hell are we taking their contributions? Um, there's a lot of ways that we could address these problems, and, and it seems to me that it's going to require a combination of technology, social movement, right, regulation, and perhaps at the margins, copyright licensing, but that it is surely no panacea. Well, interesting choice of words there. Uh, sound and fury. Uh, Jelaine, you want to go next? <laughs> um, so this uh, title, I think, in this talk changed a few times because when Mishi first uh, emailed me, she said it was, I, I believe, is copyright licensing the answer to everything? And I wrote back and said, well, that's going to be a really short panel because the answer is no. <laughs> and um, I think maybe the more interesting question is, uh, why, why would we think it is? Um, I think it's sort of, it, it seems to be a gut, a gut easy answer for most lawyers or lawyers I've seen discussing this, um, but it's not so easy um, outside of our little ivory tower. And, um, and so I think, I think there's a couple interesting things. Um, one is, is as, as expectations, so there's a, a lawyer who, um, Michael Weinberger, wrote a piece some time ago about applying open source concepts to other things like hardware and how it, it may not work in the same way and that we the success of open source software then creates expectations that you can be open in the same way in other venues where the IP law may not work that way. And that it's like a, it's like a, you know, victim of your own success, but that then people will be, the bad thing, the bad side of that is that people might then be very upset when it doesn't work that way. Um, so I think that um, can be applied in, in, in this area too. And I think the, these, I'm going to glump them, I'm going to put aside the business model. I mean, you guys discussed at length the, the, that aspect last year and it's, it's still relevant, obviously, but um, it seems like, to me anyway, you know, there's in this anti-vax license, the 996, the Hi Hippocratic okay. do no harm license. And that's, to me, different than, I don't know, I think, you know, different than protecting a business model. Um, and I, I, you know, I was trying to think of like, why, why do people, why, how do we get here? And, and the, the, the only thing I could think of is, is it, you know, people think of open source software licenses, free software as protecting freedom, and then you think of freedom as being sort of a cause, right? Which certainly it, you can think of it in that way. And these are causes too, so therefore, you know, why can't we just do the same thing? Um, but I think the, the thing that we need to remember as the legal community is, um, is, uh, <laughs> is the, the law is, is dispassionate, in my view, right? It's pretty unemotional, and as lawyers, we, can, you know, when we go into our legal analysis and we start talking about this, you know, we are, certainly come across as dispassionate, um, which is both valued and incredibly infuriating to our, sometimes to our employees, as well as our friends and family. I'm sure some of you have um, realized this. And so I think when you're talking to somebody who, or what we need to be better about is I think there's been a knee-jerk reaction, like, ah, this doesn't meet the OSD and this isn't going to be enforceable. And th that may be true, but someone has something they feel really passionate about. And this is, may not be or, or likely is not the best way to um, get the change they want, but, but, um, but that's still, uh, you know, we still need to sort of respect and, and, and maybe help suggest other ways. And I'm gonna just go a little bit longer. I'm gonna use a, if I'm being a little bit um, oblique, a non-inside baseball analysis, I thought, or, or uh, an anecdote uh, that I thought of. As if many of you know me, you know the other community I spent a lot of time as a cycling community. And one thing I noticed when I got out of law school, which I did later in life, was um, the way my view had changed when I'd hear about, say, a cyclist getting hit by a car and then the way the law treated that. And so what I now notice is that it, as a cyclist, when you hear about someone being hit and, you know, hit and run or some terrible scenario, you feel horrible, right? And you have this emotional reaction of like, that's terrible and that person should be held accountable and blah, blah, blah. And I you know I have friends that will be like, I can't believe they only got a year in prison for a hit and run. 
And, I, and then I'm like, well, you know, what are the sentencing guidelines? And maybe the prosecutor didn't have enough to meet the burden of proof, which is really high, uh, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. And, you know, all these things that I still vaguely remember for criminal law, which is years ago now. And, um, and I had to kind of realize, and then, and then sometimes then I get yelled at for sounding like I don't care. And so I think, you know, that, that dichotomy of going, well, I might have this emotional reaction of this being, seems super, wrong, this seems wrong, but then, you know, what's going on in the law is just the way the law works. And, you know, obviously there's other ways to change that, i.e. maybe you need to go to your legislators and say that if someone hits someone on their bike, for whatever reason, they need to have a longer sentence or whatever it is. So I think um, that's something that we, we need to remember here. And, and then refocusing like what is the goal and to sort of I don't repeat some of the things that Jim says that I agree with it like you know is this the best way to reach that goal and I have other thoughts on that but I'll leave them for the question part. Richard so uh, I think one thing that we should try to keep clear uh, here is is one of the one of the questions that these these uh, licenses are raising is not necessarily whether they are enforceable. Um, they may be enforceable in some jurisdictions and not others, for example. Um, but, or, or, and, and, and I mean, that's one question. And, and, and another question is, is uh, whether they are um, effective in general as, as um, policy instruments of some sort. But, but, the, but the third uh, part, uh, as I see it, is, is whether licenses of this sort, um, whether it's the ones we talked about last year, the business model protective licenses, or this what seems like a newer set of licenses that are more oriented towards um, uh, public policy goals, whether they should be considered um, open source or free software licenses. And that's, that's, um, that third question is going to be something we have to wrestle with even if the licenses or some of them are uh, entirely enforceable. The, I'm not sure why, for example, the um, Commons Clause, um, to take one of the ones we talked about last year, would not be enforceable. Um, the proponents of the Commons Clause did not say that it should be considered open source. Arguably, they were trying to confuse um, the line between open source and what they were they were proposing. But but um, but that's the question that 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 um, that these licenses are raising. There, there is an important. Um, difference um, raised by these um, public policy licenses that we that aren't really relevant to the ones we talked about last year. So, and, and both of these kinds of licenses are not new. Um, we, we've had both serious and joke licenses in the past that have uh, purported to address evils, and we've had business model protective licenses that seem to sort of stretch the definition of open source uh, or free software in the past. So they're not new, but, but what, I, what I think is different now is that that the, um, both of them, both of those kinds of um, uh, license experiments seem to be getting publicized around the same time. And th there's a kind of, they're coupled with a kind of attack on existing institutions that I don't know that we really saw uh, in the past. The, the um, interesting thing about the public policy licenses is, and maybe it's kind of obvious, is that um, the people who are proposing them are not like the, uh, so-called open source companies and, and the VC-funded startups that propose the other set of licenses, they are actually much more sympathetic to, to, to my mind. They are, um, they are actually people who identify as individual developers and technologists in the open source community. They probably don't actually use the term free software, but they probably do use the term open source. They identify, they do, they do use the term open source, and one of the issues that they're raising is that open source as a concept should be defined by uh, by their community. Um, and I see part of what's going on is a kind of generational uh, rebellion. I think a lot of uh, the supporters of these new licenses, from what I can gather, are uh, of a somewhat younger generation, um, um, you know, well, compared to, to some of us. Uh, so, so they are, they are sympathetic and they, um, and, and you know, the, the, the political goals that they have, um, leaving aside the, the, what, what may be the trolling or, or joke licenses, the, the political goals of, for example, the, the uh, Hippocratic license or the do no harm license or the anti-996 license, um, entirely sympathetic to mainstream developers in the open source community. And, and so if we think it's a bad idea to at least to um, 
confound the definition of, of open source uh, in such a way that would include these licenses, we need to convince um, uh, uh, these technologists that this is just a bad public policy idea for, for pragmatic reasons, um, uh, for legal reasons, whatever, whatever the arguments are. Okay, license boomer. Um, uh, Evan? I'm Generation X. I don't <laughs> I, I just saw this New, New York Times. They take offense of the, the, the idea of being considered a boomer uh, because <laughs> I'm too young. So. I, 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 we wouldn't want you to be offended. Um, I, surely, one of the themes here is that we are the victims of our success. Uh, we we found a way to hack copyright law to perform a really important social purpose, which as I suggested this morning, we may not have achieved, but it certainly looked good. Uh, and that gave people hope of an important kind. And Richard is correct to say, I think, that there are generational echoes of that now, which are important to me, thinking about the future of the free software movement. Making sure that people understand both what we did succeed in doing and what the limitations of that success are. And I believe the conversation we are having, both among ourselves and with the makers of new licenses, is about understanding what we should be modest about and what we should be triumphalist about. Uh, the, the underlying proposition was that we could use the power of the statutory monopoly given to A to help B. B was a user in our original conception, and the rights of the user were protected not by B herself, but by A, who had written the program and had the copyright, and who could step in to use the force of law in order to secure the rights of her user, about which she was also deeply concerned. The fact that we could do that, that we could use the statutory monopoly of copyright in order to vindicate the rights of a third party was exciting, and it had great value. The thing is that we were copyright minimalists at the same time that we were doing that. We were not actually trying to make copyright stronger. We were not really interested in increasing the harshness of the statutory monopoly. We found ourselves with some political opinions, to be sure, and our background political opinions was the copyright was more than strong enough, and we wanted to find out if we could do more with less. That is to say that in the original joke, <coughs> all rights reversed, we could find a way to use the privileges of A to support the freedoms of B without giving A more privilege than she already had. And that was the condition under which we did the work of making licenses. Two things came out of that, one of which was our belief in freedom zero. That is to say, if you don't have the right to use the program for any purpose, then what rights do you have at all? And so freedom zero was canonically the first right, the one at zero where all numbering systems should begin, uh, because it was the one that was actually the one closest to the user's needs. That to begin with, copyright law would not be used to tell you how you could run a program. Later, we would vindicate also other of your rights, your right to tinker and to modify, to share, to understand, to transpose. But in the beginning, we began from the proposition that the right to use the program for any purpose was the most important right. And all the remainder of the hack proceeded on that basis. Now we are confronting licenses which are not as careful about freedom zero, let us say, as they are careful about other things. Whether those things are the interests of the businesses licensing the software or the interests of the workers working for the company that makes this, or whatever they are, they're not mostly concerned with freedom zero anymore. This raises the point that Richard points to, which is a definitional one. If you're not really careful about freedom zero, are you open source, are you free software? That's a good question. But as a law professor, I'm a legal realist, and I don't much care what things are called compared to what they do. So naturally, I find myself in a skeptical frame of mind about the freedom 0.3, 0 0.7 point. I need freedom zero. I really need it. I always needed it. It was very important. And, and I, too, maybe because I am a boomer and whether proud of it or not, I have to cop to the thing. Maybe I should admit that this could feel old-fashioned 
to other people. I also think that I agree with Richard about the difference between the proponents of the Commons Clause or the SSPL on the one hand and the 996 license on the other. I see that primarily as the difference between people I don't represent and clients I do have. What I thought you actually said there was these are the kinds of people we can imagine ourselves advising or at least at SFLC I can think of myself as advising such people and I do. So as my lawyer, as my client's lawyer, what do I want to say about these licenses? I don't want to say they're unenforceable only. I don't want to say they're not adequately respectful of freedom zero. I want to say, danger, danger, Will Robinson. Don't use these licenses. They're bad for you. They're potentially harmful. And I wish to say that on a narrow legal ground. Most of the time when we talk about copyright law in our circle, we begin by moaning about how little copyright law knows about software and how all the cases aren't about software and how we never know, really know about software and we have to guess. But this is not one of those times. As license makers, one of the things which has always concerned us was not going too far. Not being too restrictive, even when we felt like it. Because out there, there was a doctrine of copyright misuse, and we didn't want to stumble over it. Now, here I am not in the position of beginning by moaning about how we don't know what the law is of copyright misuse with respect to software, because the copyright law is never about software. On the contrary, this is a, an unusual example. 80% of the cases in the United States Courts of Appeals about copyright misuse are about copyright misuse with respect to software. Software is actually the area in which copyright misuse doctrine has had its best run in the United States federal courts. And what I want to say about that is copyright misuse doctrine with respect to software as we learn it taught to us by the Courts of Appeals is pretty restrictive. Let's think about the cases, right? Laser Comb says, oh, you were engaged in copyright misuse because you put a non-competition clause for a long period of time on the software. Long period of time in Laser Comb was 100 years, which is less than the span of the copyright, I should point out. Right? And in assessment tech against AMA, the proposition was, yeah, you can use our software for your medical coding as long as you don't use any other form of medical coding too. In other words, we wish to have the policy that there should be a single form of medical coding and we use our rights in the software to prohibit that. And we, say, and, and we learned later on that the proposition from the point of view of the Seventh Circuit was, well, if you're going to be restricted in which data you can process with the software by the license, then that's copyright misuse. Now, 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 the thing about copyright misuse in the United States is that the consequence of having been found to misuse a copyright is an unenforceable copyright overall. That is to say, capital punishment for the copyright involved. So suppose I do have such a client who has a passionate concern about something and who likes to make software and who wants her making of software to reflect her passionate concern in the world and who comes to me and says, so I would like to make a license in which my passionate concern joins to my passion for software making. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Do not do this. Because that's my responsibility as a lawyer, to tell them that you are putting your assets at risk by doing this. And my job as a lawyer is to tell them not to do it. I think the primary problem that we have at the moment is licenses which are legally dangerous to the licensor. And I don't think we have adequately clarified for people what the law is, despite the fact that on this particular subject, the law is unusually clear. Karen? I know there's a lot to unpack. <laughs> All right. Um, excellent discussion. And I, I obviously agree with everything everybody said. I, I want to go to a different place. And, you know, I always start out with how smart, you know, Evan and Richard and everyone was in the very beginning. And, and the, the magic that they put in the system that not all of us realize. So, yes, at the time, uh, you know, laser comb was the law. And not pushing copyright too far 
was you know was extremely important and and there was this balance between uh, not wanting to overextend copyright and software and uh, and yet still wanting to you know preserve freedom zero by using the copyright but there was another thing going on that had uh, it was it was you know in a, in a world that was much you know younger um, which is that the whole sorting out of how software was protected under the law was still fairly new. And, you know, and there was a time when, uh, you know, the question was, you know, is this trade secret? Is it confidential? Is it this? Is it that? You know, can it be patented? And, uh, and one big concern that, uh, that people had was whether there would be use restrictions on source code that was available. So, you know, and at that time, the law was very different in terms of, of whether you could enforce something that wasn't really an intellectual property right. We spent a lot of time figuring out what was actually within the scope of copyright, what was actually within the scope of a, of a trade secret under the statute. You couldn't make up rights and enforce them by contract. And, and that has completely changed over the past 30 years. Uh, so you can make things up and enforce them by contract. Um, and so the idea that it would have to be a trade secret in order to be subject to a contractual use restriction is, is, is sort of lost. Well, we created this community full of software that everybody can learn from. And Eben talked about this a little bit earlier, how important it was to be able to, uh, and it is, to be able to study the code, learn from the code, and take those ideas someplace else. And one piece of the magic of limiting the protection to copyrights was that we automatically eliminated the concept of, being, uh, of restricting the use of ideas, the reuse of ideas. You know, the phrase ideas, know-how, concepts, and techniques. They're not covered by copyright. So you begin to introduce these, these restrictions that look a lot like use restrictions and you begin to be concerned about whether you're um, actually uh, imposing uh, restrictions that are consistent with your copyrights and whether you're now imposing restrictions that are, are consistent with contract law. And we could have communities of software with use restrictions that we've all you know, thought about a lot in terms of NDAs that are, they're not, it's not a trade secret because it's open, but it's a use restriction on the reuse of the ideas in the code. <laughs> We don't even know how to begin to deal with those things. So, you know, I was just mentioning to, to Eben that, you know, you go back to the SCO litigation, and when it was originally announced, there were three parts to it. There was a trade secret allegation, there was a copyright allegation, and there was a patent allegation. And the one that, that you know, the people I was talking about were most concerned about was the trade secret allegation, the violation of a use restriction, the carrying ideas from one piece of software to the other. And you know, how would you ever know or prove what would be the boundaries of that analysis? See, we know in some ways, even though Eben's obviously right that we are frustrated with our, our, the details of copyright laws applied to software, we do have a way to apply copyright to software. We don't even have a way to begin applying use restrictions in terms of ideas on software. And when you look at a lot of these, so, uh, these licenses where they are really expanding the restrictions beyond copyright, what they are is they're putting a use restriction, a word that does not appear in the Copyright Act. They're putting a use restriction on the software, which applies not just when you're using or, or exercising your copyrights, but applies potentially when you're using the underlying ideas and learning in the software. And I think that would be a disaster. Okay, on um, that high note, um, <laughs> Richard, do you want to talk a little bit further about what Karen and Evan both touched, and maybe Jim, you as well, about Freedom Zero? Why, what is it? Why is it important? And when we are talking about these public policy licenses, how do we think about what Freedom Zero asks us to do? And um, if is it true that anything that we, we deem that people are doing wrong with the software, we can in theory stop them by using these license terms? Uh, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, 
I mean, obviously, Freedom Zero, so from, from our perspective, inside uh, free software and open source, Freedom Zero is, is fundamental. Um, one of the issues that, that has come up in uh, recent times in the context of the uh, open source definition of the, the OSI is the seeming um, uh, inadequacy of the definition, the formal definition, because it doesn't seem to address Freedom Zero. And so those of us who who think about this uh, have tended to say, well, it's sort of uh, emergent from, from the, the 10 explicit uh, planks of the definition. There's freedom zero has to lurk in there, and I think like McCoy has talked about this. So, so um, you, can, you can create hypothetical licenses that obviously everyone would agree inside the universe of open source that would fail the definition, but uh, because of the freedom zero problem. Uh, but it's hard to say, you know, what portion of the definition they are, they are sort of literally, the licenses are, are literally uh, violating. The, um, the problem with this, though, I, I think is that, that we're still kind of um, showing the perspective of insiders. Uh, and and these, these, um, these public policy licenses, these so-called ethical licenses are, are so, so again, I want to emphasize they're being, uh, uh, at least some of them are being proposed by um, individuals who are inside the community, they identify as part of the open source community very strongly, um, but they're not, they don't care about Freedom Zero. They've never heard of Freedom Zero. Um, that's, a, that's a Free Software Foundation concept and they don't care about the Free Software Foundation, frankly. Um, they actually don't care about the open source initiative either. They do care about open source because that's their culture and they have their own understanding of that and it has something to do with how they, how they make software, how they collaborate with one another. Um, to, to these uh, individuals, there's no contradiction between having a license that restricts Freedom Zero, or what we call Freedom Zero, and um, labeling it open source. And, and I mean, labels, yes, so, so from a legal realist standpoint, uh, why should the labels matter? But I think this is, um, I think so for, for those of us on the commercial side, the label actually matters a lot, um, at least from a, like a Red Hat perspective. Um, we, we're a company that um, uh, our whole brand identity is open source. So it's, it's a label that is of, of the utmost importance to us. We tell our customers that our products are open source. Um, our customers have come to associate that label with a set of expectations about what they can do with the software. If um, the community that's developing the software decides that um, you know, we need to evolve this definition in a whole different direction, and we need to allow certain things that maybe we assumed weren't uh, appropriate to allow in the past. What do we say to our customers about, you know, um, uh, what's in our software? Um, we have to then kind of subdivide it into, um, you know, what, what do we call it then? Unethical uh, or, or non-ethical, uh, non-ethic specific open source software? Um, it becomes a big headache from a commercial standpoint. So that's, an, that's another pragmatic argument for, for why um, the, these licenses are, that, that do restrict Freedom Zero uh, are a bad idea that m I think um, may be a source of persuasion for the proponents of these licenses because the proponents of these licenses ultimately tend to be pretty close to the commercial uh, system that we are part of as well. They're not like trying to carve off a non-commercial universe for them to sort of exist in and create software. And they're actually largely working, I think, for, um, in some way or other, working for the, the, the kinds of companies that are already, you know, very heavily dependent on um, producing technology and software. So this may be a, a pragmatic source of persuasion. I guess, in, in my mind, I feel like for m many of these licenses are unlikely to run into the sort of hard edge of copyright misuse, right? They, they, they don't come across as restraints of trade, right? Or, and, and the, the distribution of software uh, under these licenses wouldn't be deemed anti-competitive or, or an antitrust violation. And I guess, you know, I'd, I'd like to offer a, a one counterpoint for, for my co-panelists to consider here, which is something that you said, Richard, uh, when you were up here with Sam a few minutes ago. And that is, I'd like to think, I'd like us all to think hard about the potential for these licenses to exert social pressure 
against the users of the software and i guess you know the the question is you know put aside the enforceability questions for a minute because you know vmware didn't cause us to throw the gpl out the window right um i think if we're going to decide that it's a bad idea i'm going to fall back on what i said at the beginning which is around pragmatism the commercial and other concerns around attempting to manage these ethical or public policy licenses in an ecosystem of great complexity right that trying to manage a bunch of different public policy objectives that could be potentially conflicting that are often vague and and, and attempting to do so in uh, multi-tiered distribution chains with potentially you know uh, indirect infringement liability it, it just it strikes me as impracticable but that said I don't know I'm not I don't want to be too dismissive of of the potential for social influence so can I respond yes to please mm -hmm. um, so I was afraid we get on this panel and we all kind of agree so I'll try to take I'll try to take your contrarian and raise you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so as I was reading I I'd read the li the licenses we've all mentioned um, when they first came out probably really quickly and then sort of reread them, you know, late last night. <laughs> um, but since you mentioned the JSON license, you know, I, I kind of went to that spot too of like because my general view on that, my personal view on that is like, it's just sort of ridiculous, right? Like, I'm just gonna go, that's just like not gonna, you know, I can't imagine, you know, you try to run hypothetical of a lawsuit and what's it's gonna look like and, you know, and I just go, I'm gonna just like delete that line, you know, in my head because it's, it's for a number of reasons. But um, I think that vagueness that you, ta you mentioned is, is um, you know, I think people have gotten a bit, a bit sort of smarter on that maybe. And if you read, for example, the, um, the 996 and then the, uh, the Hippocratic, or do you know her? I guess it goes by both names. I mean, it's very specific, right? It's the UN Decl Declaration of Human Rights, and there's an actively and knowingly qualifier. So just to go from a different perspective, I read this and from, you know, that we have a lot of talk about friction and making things hard and like we spend way too much time talking about license compliance and this is going to be harder. And then I kind of thought, well, really, is it? I mean, if I was going to incorporate this in some software that, you know, a company that I work for that I want to work for, you know, am I going to be working for a company to begin with that's violating human rights? I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, there, so there's one level of voting with your pocketbook, so to speak, of, of, of um, how, you know, no, hopefully no. Um, and so maybe actually that um, condition or that uh, covenant maybe under contract law um, is not a big deal at all um, and isn't really as disruptive as we're making it out to be. And, and, and in addition to that, just getting away from uh, for a second of this, the copyright misuse um, idea, I think we also are forgetting that um, companies and entities and people agree to all kinds of things all the time under contract law, right? Including complying with the law. So now I'm talking about 996 in particular. So again, you know, we, we agree to things like that all the time. I mean, and, and, and sometimes those things bleed into ethical things, especially if you've had any like flow down FAR clauses from the US government, right? <laughs> Good times. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you know, and I, so I think, w you know, when we don't, when we fail to sort of mention that and, and say, well, you know, actually under contract law, now, again, you come back to this sort of, can you enforce that if it's a contract provision, blah, 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 and then you get into the legal details of that and the point I made earlier. But, um, um, yeah, so I think, you know, th there's an interesting, it, it's not, it's not so, so maybe it's not as disruptive as we think it is. I mean, then you, then you come, kind of come back around to the freedom zero and the sort of definitional issue. But I just want to know, and I don't know if anyone else mentioned, noticed this, because I didn't see it when I looked at the Hippocratic license initially, but I just noticed it last night that um, the woman who put that up has now has a definition of ethical source code. 
So, you know, why can't there be room potentially for other definitions that aren't the free software for freedoms or the OSD um, if that's what the community is sort of demanding? I don't, I don't have answers to this. But so, that's, that's really interesting uh, because um, a lot of people do like to make definitions of their own. Uh, the UIDAI, which is a very big biometric surveillance system for 1.25 billion people, uh, in is based on India's stack, and they defined open source with their own definition, where everything uh, they can, because they've used raw materials which are open source, that's why it's open source, and they're under no obligation to show anyone anything. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious about what you said. Okay, with pragmatism aside, uh, budget is a very good tool for social policy. We've had certain, uh, we've seen in the past that there is some history of uh, community being, um, uh, coming together and being able to do that. But does that mean that we privilege a small group of people and the copyright holder then holds the power to determine which labor law violation can be enforced and cannot be enforced uh, if the copyright misuse part is accepted already, that it won't create a problem. So for the purpose of this one answer, Oracle returns to the room, yes. <laughs> well, then Oracle should say more than yes or no. <laughs> Because I'm not going to let Jim Wright say no, <laughs> and Oracle say yes. Do you want to elaborate? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah, I'll do it exactly. Look, the, the, this this touches again on one of these things that everybody kept wondering: Why do we insist about this? Copyleft licensing, as the Free Software Foundation did it, doesn't result in contracts, and we try to keep pointing that out. And and we keep pointing that out because the issue of remedies is the crucial issue. The people who want these licenses to work want to be able to abate a nuisance. They want to be able to stop a thing. They need an injunction. Contract law in all the major legal systems that we are dealing with affords them no such leverage. Down the line, they're entitled to collect some damages, roughly speaking, for the difference between the license without the restriction and the license with the restriction on software they don't sell, which ultimately winds up as a goose egg. Which is why we always tried to point out to people that we were not depending upon contractual obligation for the licenses to work because we did not want contract remedies. We wanted the great power of the property holder to exclude through the use of injunctive remedy. If we don't explain to people that their licenses will generate a different and much less satisfactory remedy for them, then once again, it seems to me, as lawyers for licensors, the very licensors Richard talks about, the people who are part of our communities, in which at least I, as a lawyer, have worked almost my entire practice career, if we don't explain to them what the risks are that they incur and what the remedies are that they're entitled to, then we're not lawyering accurately. I don't think the question really ought to be about how to classify the licenses. I do appreciate the commercial point of view. We would like to have a suite of licenses that allow us to brand and sell our products in a, in a consistent and coherent way. And there's no question that that's a large and important concern. And as free software licenses, or licensors, we always try to be sensitive to those concerns of business. And I do believe that that's a reason for not applying such licenses. But if I put myself in the primary task of informing my client what the risks are and what the remedies are for outcomes, then it seems to me once again that I have very good reasons for, for advising my clients not to use such licenses. They neither free you from risks you want to be free of, nor they, do they give you the remedies you want to have. The passion is what it is, the ability to define what we do in our community is what it is, all of those things are good. And as a lawyer, I don't want to tell my clients how to feel about situations like that. But I do want to tell them what the law says. And here I just want to make 
one tiny little point about what you said last time around. Because the copyright misuse cases don't say it's misuse because it's an antitrust violation. In fact, it's the opposite, yeah, right? Opposite. What, what Lasercomb actually said is, yeah, we, we did, under, the, under the antitrust laws, you could get away with this. And under the law of California, you could get away with this. And still, it's copyright misuse. And that's the part which, as a lawyer advising a client who wants to apply a license to a piece of software, is the thing we really need to tell them. We're not advising you as though you were an antitrust defendant. You're not. You're a tiny guy and you, you don't sell at any price and you don't exclude any from, anybody from the market and you don't restrain trade. But still, you could be misusing the copyright monopoly because the test of copyright misuse is whether it violates the policy of copyright. The copyright misuse cases are the cases where the courts of appeals are clearest about the idea that there is such a thing as copyright policy and that it extends past the words of the statute, which is why some commentators told us that we should make a statutory change to copyright law about misuse because that distrust of copyright policy extends into a broad area of copyright scholarship. But here we are with a different thing entirely, and we should be sensitive to that as the advisors of these fine people who share our values to such a great extent and who have generationally such important things they want to do. In total sympathy, we have to tell them, watch out for that. Well, and, and reverting to the pragmatism point, even if, you're, even if that is not a concern, given the particulars of the proposal, if your software will not be adopted as a consequence, yep. right, mm. then you will not achieve your objective, <coughs> right? You know, you were, you were pointing out the, the limits of enforcement, but then the limits of enforcement, you know, are also set by the limits of adoption even for Well, as you see, this is a very simple topic. I'm gonna just add a little more complication. Um, so, uh, because we're victims of our own success. What is the panel's view about FOSS or open source licensing as a template for data licensing? We've seen open database license, community data license agreement, their model data use agreements by Microsoft for training AI models. Karen, do you want to address that? Sure. All right. Um, well, I think uh, there is so much that we've learned. There, there's so much that we've uh, come to know is possible through open source. I mean, we, we could never have, have envisioned that we would be where we are. Um, so there is a lot that is transferable to data because I think it makes people think things are possible that in, a, in, you know, with, in the absence of open source, we would have said, well, that'll never work. So I think there's a lot. I think there is a lot that is different um, about data and about data licensing. Uh, and I think you know, the, the, um, the absence of copyright law, again, is an important point. And that, that is that you know, we, we have the data and we, and we don't have a specific set of statutory rights that limit you know, exactly what you can do with that data. We just, you know, there's, there's the data. And, uh, and, and now we're putting them into these separate uh, pools of data. And they're subject to these, you know, restrictions or non-restrictions that are articulated in different ways. And the data is valuable because it is aggregated, and that could be aggregated as in time or aggregated across, you know, use cases. Um, so if you, you know, if you if you decide that you need to change a license and you're going to start over in, at, you know, 2025 and therefore you cannot combine with, with the data that goes back to you know, 2010, that's a tremendous loss. Um, you can't assume that you're going to be able to write out the data that is subject to a different restriction. So I think you know, there's a much more compelling reason to think that we have to get this right from the get-go because we're creating assets that will continue to exist in, in perpetuity and that will have uses that we can envision and, uh, and that uh, need to be able to be combined over time so those other uses can be, uh, you know, can, 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 uh, can be enjoyed. Uh, and, it's, and it's hard because there, you know, we learned this morning, well, once again, that people see 
data as possibly being so unbelievably valuable that they're afraid, you know, they're, they're back where they are being afraid to give up, you know, any kind of interest like they were with their being afraid to give up any copyright interest for their software years ago. Um, so I, I think there are lots of things that we have learned about what's possible in communities, about the value of simple licenses, um, about the value of avoiding license proliferation, um, about the difficulty of dealing with intellectual property where um, you know, the IP rights, or rights are, are unclear, um, about the importance of, of, of governance, of community governance, and ways of, of uh, reaching consensus about, uh, about the uh, goals of a particular community. I think we've learned an enormous amount that's transferable. Uh, but I think we have a lot less room to make mistakes in some ways on data than we did with software. Jim. And no yes or no answers are allowed. <laughs> but you're talking about data license. Yeah, exactly. Um, When I deal on a daily basis um, with the various product teams and also research teams uh, who are using data uh, for machine learning as well as more pedestrian applications, um, I have found that the complexity of navigating the licenses that were developed for data at, to be substantially higher, actually, than when dealing with the, open, the data that is licensed under open source terms. So I guess col color me somewhat conflicted. Um, you know, usually, usually uh, this team sees me up here um, standing against the anti-proliferation group, right? Usually I'm, I'm in favor of uh, license innovation, permitting, of encouraging license innovation for new applications because I think we didn't get it all right 20 years ago. Um, and, and by the way, all data should be licensed under the UPL. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yes. <laughs> with, with, the larger, with the larger work... With the larger work... Lar yeah. With the larger works file that says all Oracle products. Yes. Um, but... The, but um, I think, frank, frankly, my, my impression has been that um, the large proportion of data, I, I've seen very little attempt by the folks who are making data available. I've seen, I've seen very few instances of folks attempting to impose copyleft or any analogous obligations on it. and. and the reason for that, I think, is that other f folks in this field have found the uses of such data um, all but impracticable. And because the data derives so much of its value from combination, um, the, the complexity of attempting to commingle data from different sources, um, is, it gets out of hand very rapidly. And the you know, as, as a consequence, I guess, I'm okay with common open source licenses being applied to, to data even where you might think that it's not a great fit, only because I find those licenses more understandable and that the implications of their combinations more understandable than that of licenses of arbitrary complexity, which I've seen applied by a variety of academic and governmental institutions. Well, I asked all the questions, but uh, I'm still going to allow for at least two questions. And in the meantime, uh, other panelists and this panelist should think of one thing which is not on your resume to introduce yourselves. Uh, Sam? On the microphone, Sam Hartman again. I think there's been uh, there's a critical disconnect uh, 
between the panel going up there and some other important aspects of the community. Um, particularly, you know, I hear Richard talking about how these people probably haven't heard about the Free Software Foundation. And yet, the closing keynote at this year's Libre Planet was specifically urging the free software community to adopt ethical responsibility for the software that we make. Um, and I think that this is likely to be one of the key topics of next year's Libre Planet is discussing whether how we achieve um, ethical licenses or how we achieve being ethical engineers if not through copyright, because a lot of us really do value freedom zero. But no, I think this is actually going to be a, a big free software issue. Um, and it seems like it's going to, like across the entire community. I mean, like for example, if you take a look at Matthew Garrett's recent blog posts, um, you're starting to see this in people who've been around for a long time, starting to explore whether there's something we need to do to embrace ethics. Um, to Jim's point, I think 20 or 30 years ago, there was a, you know, a different person kind of taking your role saying, oh, this open source stuff, it's way too complex. It will never be adopted because it's, it's, it's not acceptable from a pragmatic standpoint. Um, and to one of Evan's points, there was a um, panel at this year's Libre Planet talking about what the courts have um, told us about the GPL. Um, you know, with uh, the, the speaker was um, one of the, the Council for Civic Action. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the gentleman's name. Mark, Mark Jones. Okay, yes, thank you. Um, and, and he was actually focusing on, well, how we may not have intended for the GPL to establish a contract, but courts have definitely established that it does, and that that's been relevant to a lot of the cases that, that he was presenting in that panel. So I guess basically what I'm saying is that there's some really interesting, like we should be working more as a community and getting better cross-pollination to actually move forward on this issue. Okay, um, does anyone want to respond? Because I can see that we're running late by several minutes. And I'm gonna ask uh, the panel to respond, no? Okay, mic drop. Uh, one more question. There, uh, please state your name, and then uh, we'll end this panel. Hi, uh, I'm Angelina Fisher from um, NYU um, Law School. So um, I wanted to ask maybe somewhat a provocative question, which seemed to be lurking um, in, in some of the things you've said, which is whether the time, so, so the idea of OSS community has been developed predominantly with an idea that it's a US-based community, um, but, um, and you know the o the OSI kind of being the the arbiter of what's open source or not. But um, I think as um, Misha point Misha pointed out, there's now communities that are develop increasingly developing outside of the U.S. of perhaps larger sizes, uh, more diverse, with different definitions. Um, and so the it kind of I think begs the question as to whether the entire idea of community of OSS and therefore of OSS governance structure needs to be revisited. And I think the, the point with the data um, is a good one because in fact one of the difficulties with applying licenses to data is actually there isn't a clear data community because it defies not just because of kind of aggregation but also because it comes from different jurisdictions sort of defies all of these things. Which then raises the next question as to whether licenses or these kinds of instruments that are jurisdictionally tied in terms of their legal effect are the right tool and should we be thinking of different um, legal tools now to regulate both OSS and open data? That was a wonderful question uh, and very thoughtful and one we could talk about for a long time. So let me just make a couple of points. Is One is I think you're raising a really interesting question about um, focusing on governance of a community uh, and the way that, gov that community is governed as a way to um, uh, continue to evolve the understanding of that community. And, and again, you know, Evan and Richard, et cetera, have, have been the stewards of this, uh, of this community for a long time. That's an absolutely essential role of having a governance. The fact, when we put something in a license, we're thinking about litigating enforceability. 
And when you start talking about litigating things internationally, where there's different interpretations and different, there's a huge, in my opinion, inefficiency in that that structuring the governance to be able to come to a clear consensus about expectations is the primary, you know, is, is primarily important. Um, and your, your points on data are all, you know, well taken. The, the laws around the world are, are much more different than they are similar uh, about data. And therefore, you know, simplicity and the lack of complexity becomes even more important uh, as you're trying to, uh, to have, uh, the, uh, create a level playing field globally so that there aren't differences in, you know, different rights in different jurisdictions. We can't, can't really avoid that, but the, the more we can clarify, simplify, and, uh, and work through community rather than through uh, litigation, the closer we are to a global effort. Um, we'll address some of this. There's an afternoon panel about FAWs in Asia because um, most of the world lives elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, please give a round of applause for our great panelists. <laughs> and maybe later they can tell something about themselves off resume 